A matter of grave concern for all right-minded people, Pochi and the IRA in 1920. The Irish War of Independence was a boon for those who could profit from the slackening of law and order, especially those in the business of illegal distillation. The production of pot gene, or moonshine, flourished in Ireland in the years immediately following the First World War. This raised a dilemma for the IRA. Fighting a guerrilla campaign against an enemy with significant advantages, they could scarcely afford to divert resources towards combating the pot gene trade. Yet supporters of Sinn Féin saw in this an opportunity to demonstrate their fitness to rule in Ireland, as well as sending a clear signal about the values that their proposed new Irish Republic would hold dear. The concept of pot gene uh, has always been tied directly to legal status. The private distillation of whisky is a practice that dates back centuries in Ireland. But when the British government tried to regulate its production in the 18th century, a divide emerged. Whisky became, came to mean a spirit that was legally manufactured and upon which duties were paid. Thus, it was often labelled Parliament whisky. Pochine was often almost identical to whisky, but was made at home, illegally, in a copper pot still, with the Irish word pota, or pot, being the basis for the word pochine. During the 19th century, pochine was often believed to be a superior product to legal whisky, but the impact of the famine, the rise of the temperance movement, and the growing use of substandard materials to make pochine saw its popularity fall. Its production largely became confined to rural areas in the northwest. However, the, legal, the rising cost of legal alcohol due to the First World War saw a surge in pochine production. The Connacht Telegraph reported in 1919, and I quote, The supply of Parliament whiskey, having been stopped illicit distillation, uh, sorry, forgive me, the supply of Parliament whiskey, having been stopped, illicit distillation has sprung into life, and the private stills cannot supply the demand, and when the government is so blind in the matter, the people have to take the remedy into their own hands. And native whiskey is now as plentiful as in the good old days when it was the national beverage. The rise of Republican paramilitary activity during the previous decade also assisted illegal distillers in distracting the attention of the Royal Irish Constabulary. With Irish volunteers active uh, in many of those same areas, it is not surprising that members of the IRA were familiar with illicit whiskey. From witness, witness statements submitted to the Bureau of Military History Project, we learned the various ways Republican paramilitaries used Pochine during the Irish War of Independence. Thomas O'Mahony, an Irish volunteer from Galway, was shot during an incident in September 1920. He was taken to a house where he was tended to by one Dr. O'Malley, who, and I quote, told me to lie on a couch and to drink about a noggin of something that tasted like whiskey. I think it was Pachin. Dr. O'Malley had brought it with him, I think. It very nearly put me to sleep, as I was not accustomed to any intoxicants at the time. As IRA columns uh, lived on the run and often conducted operations in poor weather, Pachin was occasionally used as a guard against the elements. Edward O'Neill told of one incident in 1920 when his unit in Tipperary was on the move in the middle of December. He recalled, and I quote, It was very bad weather, the ground being covered with snow. Fortunately, one of the local men had good, got hold of a couple of bottles of potine, and a good swig of this helped keep the cold out as we made our way in the darkness through rough, hilly country. One IRA unit in Inchigila in Cork tried to use potine to capture a police barracks. And in June of 1920, they came up with the idea of using Pochine spiked with a sedative to incapacitate local police officers. One of the Inchigila Irish volunteers was Con Murphy, who happened to be friendly with an RIC constable stationed in the town. The idea was that Murphy would bring a bottle of Pochine into the barracks and would have the policemen drink it. A group of 10 IRA men uh, would then uh, wait outside and when the drink had taken effect, they would storm the building. A local doctor provided the pot gene to, uh, to, to, to provided the drug to enhance the intoxicating potency of the pot gene. On the night the plan was to be implemented, Murphy went to the barracks and gave his friend the pot gene. But the man became violently sick. Not surprisingly, the other police officers refused to touch the drink, and the plan had to be aborted. It is not surprising that Murphy's friend became ill on consuming pot gene. Uh, 
as witness statements suggest that some of the homemade whiskey being distributed at the time was not pleasant to consume. Michael O'Donoghue was, a, was an irregular fighting in the, against the newly established Irish Free State in 1922. Passing through Ballymote at a later date, O'Donoghue was presented with an entire bottle of potgeen, but leaving town, his car got a puncture. As he stooped to fi fix the wheel, O'Donoghue felt, and I quote, a scalding wet sensation around my loins and down my thigh. I thought I was bleeding, but no, the cork had come out of the bottle of potgeen with all my exertions and the virulent stuff was scorching my skin like acid. While most of the whiskey had spilled out, there was a little left in the bottle and O'Donoghue, for whatever reason, decided to try it. He recalled, and I quote, It was vile, a burning soapy taste which almost roasted my tongue and gullet. I was almost smothered and spluttered and coughed as I tried to get my breath. While the Irish volunteers might have had their use for Pachin, it was uh, their main association with the spirit during the Irish War of Independence was their efforts to stamp out its production. This was the culmination of almost a century of political evolution, which saw abstinence shift from being a unionist cause to one championed by revolutionary Irish nationalism. The temperance movement began in Britain in the 18th century and was strongly associated with Protestantism. While Father Theobald Matthew was very successful in promoting abstinence among the Irish Catholic population in the 1830s, his most prominent supporters were, as Elizabeth, as Elizabeth Malcolm writes, and I quote, anxious to proclaim their loyalty to a government which was anathema to Irish patriotism and unrelenting in their condemnation of many aspects of Irish character and society. But, by the, uh, but Catholic temperance societies in Britain and the United States in the late 19th century eventually extended their influence to Ireland. Several new Catholic societies emerged in the 1880s and 1890s, although there was considerable debate about whether temperance or abstinence should be the goal. The most successful of these organisations uh, was the Pioneer Total Abstinence Society, established by Father James Collin, pictured here, in 1898, which had over quarter of a million members by 1919. The militant spirit associated with the abstinence movement fitted in with many new nationalist organizations emerging at the turn of the 20th, of the 20th century, especially the GAA, the Gaelic League, and Sinn Féin. For example, the GAA manual of 1907 stated that the ideal Gael was, and I quote, a matchless athlete, sober, pure in mind, speech and deed, self-possessed, self-reliant, self-respecting. Meanwhile, in 1911, Father Cullen, who established the Pioneer Total Abstinence Society, gave a speech at a meeting of the Temperance Society at Vinegar Hill, outside of Enniscorthy. He declared, and I quote, Vinegar Hill, on which we stand, has its warnings for us. In these very fields, your fathers fought and fell. Fell not so much beneath the fire of the North Cork Militia and the Orange Yeomanry, as by the treachery of drink. Drink lost the battle at Ross, lost the battle at Wexford and helped the disaster of Vinegar Hill. Ireland lost all her fights through drink. Many militant Republicans were determined to learn to show that this lesson had been learned and it is not surprising that some Irish volunteers had a zeal for tackling what they saw as Ireland's alcohol problem. At times this came to the fore in Republican attempts to force pubs to shut on Sundays or to abide with legal closing times. But the most concentrated effort, or efforts the Irish volunteers made in this regard, were in trying to stem efforts to produce and distribute Pachin. It wasn't until the summer of 1920, however, that the first real campaign against illicit distilling took place, and it seemed to have begun largely by chance. In June of 1920, Francis Tommen and some other members of the Monaghan Irish volunteers were attending a dance in Clonus. And I'm going to quote uh, Tommen here. Towards the end of the dance, one of the Clonus volunteers reported that some potgeen was offered for sale by a certain gentleman. On investigation, it was further learned that a small quantity had been actually made by this man. The men reported this to their commanding officer, who was Owen O'Duffy. Um, and O'Duffy decided to hold the man prisoner and interrogate him about the making of potgeen in the district. Having received, received the desired intelligence, O'Duffy rounded up 12 IRA members who were at the dance and immediately set out to find the Pachin still. They barged into the house of the suspected distiller and destroyed the equipment and Pachin they found 
on the site. The incident seemed to generate in O'Duffy a zeal for cracking down on Pochin in Monaghan. A few days later, he spoke at a meeting in St. Joseph's Hall in Clonus, and he spoke of, and I quote, the necessity for the men of Ireland being sober, self-respecting and self-reliant and dwelt on the abuses of putchy making and drinking, Sunday drinking and daily loitering of young men in public houses. In former Irish movements, their people were deliberately disorganised and conquered through the means of drink. But today their forces stood for sobriety and were ter- determined to make Ireland a sober nation. O'Duffy promised that his men, and I quote, would take in hand the wiping out of the Pachin evil, the prevention of drunkenness and Sunday traffic in alcoholic liquor. Soon, Irish newspapers were reporting on Pachin raids by Irish volunteers across Monaghan. John McKenna was a member of the IRA who took part uh, in one search, search, one search in Nublis. He recalled, and I quote, we destroyed Pachin in the course of manufacture and Pachin making equipment to a value which was estimated at 800 pounds. Given that this would equate to over $40,000 in contemporary currency, one can understand what a painful loss it was for the Pachin makers. A flurry of raids in the summer of 1920 appeared to have had the desired impact. One volunteer, P.V. Hoey, remembered that, and I quote, this degrading traffic was practically eliminated. In the wake of the Monaghan Pachin searches, Regular reports appeared in the Irish press about Republican efforts elsewhere to suppress illicit distillation and the enforcement of closing hours. It is difficult to say, however, whether this was because our volunteer units elsewhere were inspired by the media attention to emulate the efforts of O'Duffy and his men, or whether Irish journalists simply began paying more attention to an ongoing practice in light of what happened in Monaghan. In August, for example, 30 uh, masked men burst into a house in Ballyscally in Tyrone in the early hours of the morning. Um, they ordered uh, me, they ordered the, the man living there, and I quote, out of bed, blindfolded him, and made him swear he would give up the manufacture of illicit spirits on the penalty of being shot. The raiders then went off and went through a similar performance at the houses of two other men in the neighbourhood. Throughout the summer and autumn of 1920, uh, regular reports like, r- reports like this appeared regularly um, in the in, in, in Irish newspapers, uh, especially across the northwest, Pachin raids could sometimes turn deadly. Um, John Mullen was a farmer in Kilocken in Tyrone. He had been a member of the Irish Volunteers, but left in part it seems because of his unwillingness to stop making Pachin. On December twenty third, Mullen learned that an armed party was making its way to his house to search for Pachin. What happened next is unclear due to conflicting accounts, but a gunfight broke out that left Mullen dead. Evidently, uh, Pachin searches could be a dangerous business as distillers might turn to armed resistance to protect their product and equipment. The question that might be asked then is what motivated IRA units to get involved in this business at all? It seems many of the Irish volunteers genuinely believed that the consumption of Pachin was damaging both on an individual and communal level. Patrick McKenna said that the growing spread of the spirit was, and I quote, a matter of grave concern to all right-minded people. The consumption of this raw spirit in any appreciable quantities had such a demoralizing effect on the people who use it and created such a bad example generally that even the volunteers might fall victim to the evil. Something had to be done about it. But many IRA members appreciate the propaganda value of tackling the trade, and this, is, this was almost certainly the single biggest reason for why Irish volunteers went searching for stills. In particular, Republicans were aware that taking a stance against Pachin would make their cause in general more appealing to Catholic church leaders in Ireland, who were strongly critical of illegally produced whiskey. In his Lenten pastoral speech in the spring of 1921, Patrick Morris Rowe, pictured here, the Bishop of Achenry, uh, was scathing in his condemnation of Pachin, declaring, and I quote, This abominable evil is the source of fetid corruption in every district where it existed. This accursed liquor finds its way to the lips of even children and young girls. It is introduced into the dance house, and only God himself can tell the extent of the harm and the number of unmentionable atrocities for which it stands sponsor. Given such strong views among the clergy, IRA commanders understood that targeting illicit distillers could only serve to make their cause appear at one with that of the Catholic Church hierarchy. 
In order to drive home the link between the Republican cause and Catholic morality, Irish volunteers often see stills and display them in churchyards on Sunday. Um, in a clear in June of 1920, it was reported that, and I quote, On Sunday, about 10 stills were displayed at the local chapel gates as proof of the good work done during the preceding week. The Sligo Champion reported on searches in Screen and Drumard in August of 1920, declaring, and I quote, On last Saturday, the local volunteers captured two stills, one of them in action at the time. On Sunday, they were smashed into smithereens outside Screen Chapel by two brawny members of the Irish vol or the Volunteer Corps. And in August 1920, the Irish Independent published a sketch, which you see here on the screen, of one such display in Bally Shannon in Donegal. As you can see, the picture shows three putching stills on a table outside Bally Shannon Church, beneath a sign reading, Seized by the Volunteers. As a propaganda exercise, the crackdown on Putjean uh, was a success as there were many declarations of support for the Irish volunteers. An editorial in the Western People proclaimed, and I quote, Were the volunteers doing no better work than suppressing the manufacture of Putjean in the localities and curtailing the drink traffic in licensed houses, it would be enough, uh, quite enough to earn for them the esteem of all who have the best interests of their country at heart. One of the most extraordinary displays of support for the Irish Volunteers campaign came from an anonymous unionist who gave an interview to the London Derry Sentinel. He stated, and I quote, I am a unionist, but I have no hesitation in declaring that Sinn Féin has done more in the past three months to stop the deadly industry than the police have been able to do in the last 20 years. If Sinn Féin would only stop at putting down illicit distillation, it would be well for the country. And one of the strongest statements of support uh, for the activities of the Irish Volunteers came from the Catholic Total Abstinence Federation of Ireland. In the summer of 1920, this organisation published a statement decrying the, glowing, the growing influence of Putchin in Ireland, in which they declared, and I quote, We congratulate the executive authority of the Irish Volunteers on the steps they have taken and are taking to stamp out the curse of Putchin making. And furthermore, that we earnestly solicit for those efforts the prompt and effective support of the Irish people. Now, this statement was sent uh, to all local government boards and councils in Ireland, where members were asked to, voice, to vote their support. And as a result, we were able to get some idea of what the reaction was to the campaign of the Irish Volunteers through the views expressed during these board meetings. As these bodies debated the merits of these statements, it was apparent that not everyone was thrilled by the actions of the IRA. When the Galway uh, County Council debated the matter, when Mr. Haverty said that he was against, and I quote, condemning putching making, against condemning putching making, referring to the destruction of putching by volunteers, he said he would be more in favour of walking into public houses and smashing all the whiskey bottles on which a tax was paid to the British government. There was no tax paid on putching, and what they should aim at was to get it under control, the control of Doyle Aaron. At a meeting of the Donegal Board of Guardians in July of 1920, one Mr. Dunian, and I quote, described the resolutions as a rigmarole and said they tackled the poor peddler. The Irish volunteers should let them alone. The main thrust of the, the, main thrust of the argument against the activity of the Irish volunteers was, as, was that as the British government profited from legal alcohol sales, Pachin distillation was the lesser of two evils. While all boards ultimately voted to endorse the statement of the Catholic Total Abstinence Federation, the destruction of Pachin stills clearly wasn't universally approved. The surge of still searches that preoccupied various IRA units across the second half of 1920 petered out as quickly as it began. The question is why? It is notable that the last Putchin raid reported on by Irish newspapers uh, during the Irish War of Independence was the one that left John Mullen dead in Tyrone. This, not surprisingly, led to criticism of the Irish volunteers. Patrick McKenna remembered that, and I quote, our local parish priest denounced our actions in raiding for Pachin. The denunciation was probably promoted by the death of the young man who had resisted us in carrying out our orders. In light of this, a decision may have been taken among IRA units to step back from searching for illicit whiskey. After all, if part of the motivation for the raids had been to win approval from Catholic clerics, then the extrajudicial shooting of Catholic farmers was likely to have the opposite effect. Of course, other factors possibly played a role in the decline of such activities. 
the death of John Mullen may have caused many distillers to cease their activities in fear for their lives. As the conflict between the IRA and Crown forces intensified in 1921, it may also have been that local commanders no longer felt they could divert resources towards policing the pottery and trade. In all likelihood, some combination of all these factors likely curtailed the Pochine raids on behalf of the IRA. While the Pochine campaign of the Irish Volunteers has largely been forgotten today, its importance should not be overlooked. It demonstrated that even amongst the most committed of Irish Republicans, the desire to appease the leadership of the Catholic Church could be quite strong. It shows that in terms of ideological purity, Irish Republicanism wore its secularism very lightly. It suggested that should the Irish Volunteers succeed in establishing a newly independent state, its revolutionary nature would be heavily cloaked in Catholic social conservative thought. So it ultimately proved. Thank you.